If you haven't checked out Everbook at everbookforever.com, you should definitely go over and do that. See what Brian Wolfmuller and I are up to. It will help you do more good. Can you imagine being the son of a king? And not just any king, like a, a king of kings, an imperial king. Yeah, British Empire doesn't quite cut it. We're talking ancient Oriental empires here. Guys who fearlessly destroyed their enemies, ad- absorbed their nations, sometimes put their own enemies onto thrones underneath them, said, sure, fine, you can rule under me. You're worth it. Guys who had so much wealth, so much power, that they could host banquets for 1,000 people, 1,500 people, all in the same space, with them sitting at a single table up above that space, looking out over it all, smiling, drinking, chewing on the food before anybody else gets to it, and then saying, yep, you are at my feet, world. What's it like to be that guy's son? It's got to be hard. I mean, Luther says this very well, that the worst thing you can do for a young man is give him what he wants. That's about right. Our sinful nature is quite competent of taking any good thing and ruining it, (laughs) using it for a selfish reason, assuming that it's there no matter what, assuming that it's there because of who we are, not because of random chance or good work. But that's, well, that's who Belshazzar was. Belshazzar was the son of a king, the son of King Nebuchadnezzar. And we don't know a great deal about him. In fact, as we'll see, there's some confusion there. But we're going to assume from the start that the biblical account is true. And I think I'll be able to affirm that from the extra-biblical sources once we look at them carefully. But what it tells us is that this guy was, again, the son of Emperor Nebuchadnezzar, and that at some point after all that we've heard so far in God's judging story as told to us through Daniel, and God bringing Daniel, the fugitive and exile, into the land, establishing him as one of the wisest men in the land, and doing this in order to bring conversion to Nebuchadnezzar himself, to make him praise the God of Israel over his own gods, even though it may he had to go through massive dreams that terrified him and, and a madness that made him live with fingernails like a crow's claws and eating grass like a cow. After all of that, at some point, Nebuchadnezzar eventually does what all people do, and he dies. And his son, another place is named, I believe, Evil Merodach. Evil Merodach. How do you say it? It really isn't the word evil. It sounds like it. Avil Merodach. His son named Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5. He ascends the throne. Now from all accounts that we have of the guy who immediately ascends the throne after Nebuchadnezzar, He was, in every way, a worthless man. He was a bad ruler. He he was Rehoboam on steroids. Oh, 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 who is Rehoboam, right? That's the son of Solomon, the guy who listens to the counselors that are his own age rather than to his father's advisors, and as a result ends up basically destroying his own kingdom out from under his own feet. Belshazzar is like that, only rather than have a split in the kingdom, what eventually happens to him is, is that his own friends just murder him. <laughs> the people who he's having be his advisors decide, yeah, this guy can't do it. If, if this guy is allowed to rule, we're all going down, so uh, tonight we're going to do a coup. We're going to kill him. Huh? Now, this is exactly what Daniel chapter 5 is about. The events that lead to that insurrection, and yet something more as well. I'm kind of torn here about what to do. I want to talk about the problems, but before we talk about the problems, the challenges, the way we understand this text, you just kind of got to, you got to love the text on its own. I mean, it's a story that is so powerful, so intriguing, that Dan Carlin of Hardcore History, which if you don't know his show, you should find it, but don't stop listening to my show when you find it. His doesn't have the Bible quite, well, really much at all. His is really about history, but his show is so much the inspiration for what 
I do with Project Resurrection in these biblical deep dives. In his masterful Kings of Kings series on the Persian Empire, on Cyrus, Darius, and Xerxes, really worth listening to, 12 hours you will not regret. (laughs) Uh, In that series, he calls this biblical account one of his favorite stories of all time. Now, he doesn't believe it's true, but it's, it's that interesting. It's that spectorial, right? Uh, it, it is that haunting. So it, it starts with this guy, Belshazzar, or, or shall we call him Evil Merodach? Or, wait, there's a better name. You know, in the ancient world, spelling had a lot to do with your name as well as just pronunciation, and, and people who heard it just wrote it however they felt like. As you've heard or, or as you've seen, we sometimes get Nebuchadnezzar being called Nebuchadnezzar, right? Well, and Eusebius, one of the great church historians, calls his son Amalmerodokos. Amalmerodokos. That's better than evil Merodoc. That just sounds like a child's toy or something weird. I mean, we're totally thrown off by just the word evil. And it's not the word evil at all. It's just the sounds coming across the language. It, it really is about the work of Marduk, right? Marduk, one of the great gods, not the greatest, but one of the great gods of Babylonia. Right? The greatest is Bel. So Belshazzar, right, uh, connected to uh, saving, or the king being saved by God, right? Like Belshazzar, that's Daniel's name. They are different, but they're very closely related. And then you have, uh, you know, Amul Maradukos, man of Marduk, right? That's his name. So this guy, who's inherited wealth beyond your wildest imagination, power as well, counselors aplenty to the level where, you know, some of them aren't even really kept around all the time, as we'll maybe come back to that again with where is Daniel in, in the midst of all of this story. But he's inherited all of this, and he's using it for himself. He is not really tending to the nation. The nation is weakening during his reign, and he's splurging. So in the midst of this splurging, he throws a feast, a massive one, one of these ones I was describing earlier, 1,500 men. No, wait, I, I, read, I read the number wrong. 15,000 men. And it is likely that at these kinds of events, women were invited as well. These were events of revelry, drinking, mm, worshiping, sexing, all of the above sometimes, yeah, 15,000 plus humans, one way or the other, all gathered together in one space with him seated at a table above it, drinking and having a jolly good time thinking the world is indeed my oyster. Now, I should say something about how modern historians often will question the numbers of ancient world events, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. I've not seen any argument about this one or whether this is possible. Usually this has more to do with numbers regarding battles and how many people died in the battle, that kind of thing. But you know what? If it was 1,500, I'm still going to be impressed. 15,000, though. It's just well, The point here, if anything else, I believe it's the number 15,000, but the point here is that the guy is demonstrating his wealth and his power in an audacious way. And he's drinking deeply as he does it. So he, he's getting drunk and loving it. And he gets this idea. And, and where this comes from, I mean, he, he clearly knows something of the past. There are some arguments that this guy didn't really know his father. Nah, I think, I think the text is very clear he does. He knows his father. He knows what his father accomplished. He knows about what happened to his father and his father's madness and his father's proclamation to all the nation that they are to know the God of Israel. He knows the God of Israel, but remember, this is man of Marduk. This is Emil Maradukos. And so he decides at this huge party that he is going to go ahead and set a new precedent. And he calls for his servants and he says, hey, 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 would you go down into the cellars, the spoils, where we keep all the goods we bring back from those other places that we don't really need, but we just want to make sure they know that they're ours now, right? Go down in there and there'll be a crate down there. And it's marked with this symbol here. And in that crate, you're going to find some golden cups special, beautiful. They're nice. They're nice. I I always wonder why we didn't use them, you know, but we've got them tucked away out of some sort of piety or something. Go get those golden cups. You bring those up here. You fill them with wine so that we may make libations out of these cups. 
So off they scurry. The party goes on. There's probably some kind of music. It's not a club scene like we would have here, but there, there's, uh, there's music of some kind, revelry. And again, libations, this is where you take some of the wine in your cup and you, you pour it out. I don't know the details of it, but it's a ritual thing you do for your gods. You're not quite pouring one out for your homie, but you're pouring one out for your god. And then while you're doing that, you're still getting drunk. And then often sexuality is connected to all of this. So this is all still going on. The, the servants come back and they have these specially finely wrought golden vessels. And these are the vessels that used to be used in the temple of Yahweh, built by Solomon on Mount Jerusalem by the priests and the high priest for all of the most special Levitical rituals of Yahweh the Lord. These are the same vessels that would have been used by Aaron, the high priest, back in the days of Moses, that Moses oversaw the making of these vessels when they first set up the tabernacle. This is all according to the specific and direct instruction of Yahweh the Lord. These vessels, not only how they looked, what they were made of, what they were used for, this is, well, it's it's like the communion ware at your church, although I know for some of us, we just use little plastic things we throw away, but that's that's very new and not at all what this is like. You know, the reverence there is a little bit lacking. This is the, the chalice, right? The gold-plated, finely wrought cup. Now, some are better than others, but you, you get the idea. Well, this is that times a hundred. And he has these things brought up and he has the libation liquor put inside of them. And he begins to get drunk on it. And as he's getting drunk on it, he's not just doing this quietly. He's boasting about it out over the entire assembly. Everyone be quiet. Look here at the reliquary of the God of Israel. With He spits. What a joke that pretend God is who my father thought was real. Nothing beside Marduk and Bell of Babylonia. Nothing but a joke. Our gods made of gold are far stronger. No, forget that. Bell and Marduk, I worship them, of course, but we have other gods. We have lesser gods, gods of silver, gods of iron, gods of wood and stone. Even our Babylonian gods of stone are greater than this this pitiful excuse for a destroyed God. Where is Jerusalem now? What has this God done? And he reaches over and he he lets the lords that are around him and his many wives, his concubines, they all begin drinking from these vessels. And right at that moment, underneath the, the light, this is night, right? So they're, they're by torchlight or lamplight of some kind in this massive space, outside, inside, I don't know. There have been uh, discoveries of places like this, though. Plaster walls and whatnot. Well, There, in the midst of all of this, there appears a ghostly, ghastly finger. Now, I know that we, we, we say hand usually, but at least the way Cal and Dale treat it, it, it's just the word finger. Now, it's hard to imagine a finger without a hand. This disembodied thing, is it bleeding, blood dripping, bone sticking out? Or is it just kind of like shiny gold ghostly, not really fleshly at all? Whatever it is, it appears within the eyesight of Amal Maradukas, like really close to him. He's able to see it. And, and he, before anything else happens, he becomes ghostly white. Everyone sees it, right? He is absolutely overcome with what happened and his color on his face changes and his, his limbs, it's, the English in, in the SV is so weak. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. I mean, the guy was about to go to the bathroom in his pants, right? I mean, he was, he was in deep terror at this point. He was horrified. What is this thing? And then this thing doesn't just kind of hang there. It, it, it's by the wall and it begins to scribble on the wall. And whether most walls would have had this be easy or hard doesn't really matter. The point is that it writes four things, four runes, shall we say, right? Four four words of some kind. These are these are not words that are in any language he knows, and as as we'll see, they are not in any language anyone knows. They they're runes. It's not Hebrew, right? Some people think it's Hebrew. It's not Hebrew. This is some angelic sign. 
that gets put there. And, and he is, again, he, he, he <laughs> you can see him just falling back in his chair. Uh, his stomach is turning. His eyes are wide. And he, he begins asking, does anybody know? Does anybody see? Did you see that? And they're, yeah, they're all terrified too, right? And well, who can read this? Call the Magi. Call, call the enchanters. Have, have them all be brought into me here to read this. Bring me the Chaldeans and the astrologers so I might know what this means. In fact, I am so intent on knowing what this means that whatever man among them, whatever man among you can explain to me these runes, I will wrap you in scarlet purple. I will place a chain of gold over your neck to mark you as one of my triumvirate. So, I, you know, where people, <laughs> I can imagine I'm at this party in the way back and not because I would actually go to revelry, but you know, if, if I was at this point, I'd be like, this is weird sitting back, probably going to keep drinking and just watch and see what happens. Probably terrified as well, though. I mean, the King's upset. Yeah. That's never good for anybody. So you're sitting back and you watch and you wait and all these, these magicians and sorcerers and, and knowledge workers. Remember, this isn't just people that are, that are faking it. Go back to original wizard. This is, this is science so far as they had it. They all come in and, begin to look one at a time at this writing and they, they cannot make heads or tails of it. And this is where, so again, the one of the common approaches is to say that, well, this is an older version of Syriac or, or this is uh, this is Hebrew and they just weren't familiar with that. No, these guys were smart. They, they kept the books. These are the guys from whom come potentially at least the Magi who come to see Jesus. Right? So it's not as though they were not, cataloging the history of the world and wouldn't have had some connection to the languages of the peoples that they had conquered, especially their written languages. Remember, they're bringing them in in order to teach them their own stuff, so they're assuming that there's knowledge there. Is it possible that it's Hebrew? It's possible, but it's, it's highly unlikely. And whatever, they cannot make heads or tails of the matter. They can't read it. And Amal Meriducus is even more alarmed than before. In fact, the text tells us once more his color changed. Now is he is he gone from white to red? <laughs> A little rage boiling up in him. His his lords, his princes, his advisors among him, the ones who don't really want him to be king. Remember this: they don't really want him to be king. They think he's a bad king. They're perplexed. They're worried. And the queen, then it just Daniel's text just kind of jumps. The queen came into the banqueting hall. Now, whether she was there before this or not, how she heard that there was a stir, someone runs and tells her. Kyle and Dalich seem to think that she actually would have been going in and out regularly of this event. She would not, as Queen Mother, she would not have been participating in the revelry per se, but she would have definitely been there as a, a person of honor is expected to be at any major social event like this and nobility. This is the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. This is someone who clearly had been by Nebuchadnezzar's side the entire time that he experienced everything he experienced from the fiery furnace to the statue to the dreams to the uh, well, to the chaos and the madness that took him. So she comes in, and you have to know, I mean, if it was his own queen, because we, we don't, it doesn't say queen mother, but it, it is. If it was his own queen, his own wife, she, they were already there drinking, right? They, they would not have been able to speak to him this way. Even though she begins with, O king, live forever, the fact that she could walk up to him and just start talking, this is, remember how Esther isn't allowed to go talk to the king because she'll have to die if he, like, doesn't look at her right, right? It's that kind of place, but see, this is his mom in all likelihood. And she's coming in to say, hey, son, look, I, I know that you got this thing about your gods of stone and all, but... I mean, she's polite and all. She says, oh, king, live forever. But, uh, oh, king, uh, are you an idiot? H have you, have you forgotten? You don't have a reason to be so terrified of crazy visions and dreams. Your father had these two, and he has this man in your kingdom. He, he, he used to be in charge of a lot of stuff. In him is the spirit of the holy gods. Now, that's kind of important later there's going to be a little a little play with that language here. Notice she is not confessing Yahweh the God. She is simply saying that the gods speak to him, but she calls these gods holy, set apart, special. 
In the days of your father, she says, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And your father, the king, he made him chief of magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers because of his excellent spirit, his deep knowledge, his profound understanding, his ability to interpret dreams, riddles, signs, wonders, and problems. This man, God, is judging, she calls him, not Belshazzar. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, call him. And he'll tell you exactly what this means. Now, Amalmar Ducus called Belshazzar, called Belteshazzar, right? Notice the small difference there. He calls him in. He does exactly what his mom said. I mean, I don't know. You should love your mother. You should do what your mother says. You should always respect your mother. But there's a certain point at which the overbearing mother is the cause of the problem, son. Yeah? So here's this guy who's he's pampered and spoiled and unable to stand on his own and make good decisions. And how much of it is because when his mom tells him what to do, it's, he still does it. And yet when she's not around, he can't even tie his own shoes, right? That kind of thing. Well, he, it's good that he does this. It's right that he does this. He has Daniel brought in. And he goes, ah, I see. You're Daniel. I remember you. Now, this brings up a question. Why? Why was Daniel not brought in when all of the others were brought in? It's the same kind of question that happened with where was Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were at the big event and not bowing down and and Daniel was not there. Well, some have said that it's because Amalmeradokas knew Daniel would give him bad news and so he didn't want him to be there. That's fine. I think it's more likely that he didn't call in every single one of the various groups. He called in their representatives, their highest ones, and that Daniel was no longer in that position. That he'd either gone into some kind of retirement or that at the transition from Nebuchadnezzar to Amalmeradakis, that there had just been a shift in leadership. So like there's all the old went out and he brings in the new, the new government as it were. It's, it's a curiosity, but it really doesn't, cause a major problem unless you're just obstinate about it doing so. One way or the other, Daniel was no longer serving in the capacity he had prior served in. But this does not mean that Emil Marducas did not know who Daniel was. He clearly does. For the moment that Daniel comes in, he says, I see, you are Daniel, one of those exiles from Judah. Is he scoffing at this point? I don't know. I mean, he's, he may, he's a little terrified, right? He's just been cursing the God of Judah. He says, I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods in you. Now, there's the moment of scoff, right? I said a moment ago, he doesn't call them holy gods. That's not accidental. There is a certain crass unbelief in this guy. I've heard that you can talk to the gods. Yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, you got light and wisdom. Okay, fine. Well, the, the wise men, the magi, the enchanters, they've been here to read this rune writing here on the wall. It's pretty weird what's going on. I can't make any jokes about that at all, but they cannot do it. They can't tell me what this stuff means. I've heard you're so good. You're so great. Oh, Daniel, he can read anything. He can tell you what the dreams mean. Well, fine. Prove it now. Here's your chance. If you can read the writing and make known to me what it means, you shall be clothed with a scarlet purple robe, you shall have a chain of gold around your neck, and you shall become one of my triumvirate. And you you gotta love the brass on Daniel. I mean, he just straight up, keep your gifts. Give give that, that crap to somebody else. But I will tell you what it means. I don't care about what you think you can give me. I don't care about what you think you can say to me. I don't care about what you think I am. But I will tell you what it means, O king. And I can't say, O king, live forever because of, of what it means. But, O king, huh, the most high God, the one and only God, the God who is greater than Bel and Marduk and all the rest, he gave to your father, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingship and great, tremendous, all-seeing glory to be like a golden head upon the statues of all the world's nations that ever were. And because of that glory, under him were nations and peoples and languages who trembled and feared before him, but all of this was given to him by the one true Yahweh, the Lord. And for all the many things that he did, it was not taken from him. He killed whom he would kill. He let live who he would let live. He humbled who he would humble. 
But when he tried to stand up against the one true God, his spirit was brought down from his kingly throne. All that glory was removed to teach him who he really was and what he needed to be and who he needed to be his God. And so he was driven out from among us. Do you remember that? I know you were only eight, but you had to remember when his mind was made dumb like that of a wild donkey and he fed on the grass like a cow and slept in the mud and the the dew and the filth. Until at last he, he did come to know what I had been preaching all along. Who the one true God is. You of all people. Belshazzar. You should know what it means to humble your heart. And you have not done so. Even though you knew all these things. You have lifted up yourself against the God of heaven. Taken the vessels from his holy house. Which he has allowed your house to hold in punishment of his people. Not for you. But because of his people and their sins, he lets you hold these. You have now taken them in before you and let your concubines drink from them, praising gods that are nothing but silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, stone, whatever. They're statues, brother. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't know. But the God in whose hand is every breath you take, he knows. He knows every one of your ways and every one of your thoughts, and you have dishonored him greatly. And it's for that reason that this finger... Came. Now, no one's told Daniel that a finger wrote on the wall, by the way. He just goes, this finger came. This finger was apostled. It was sent. And this writing has been inscribed. And here is what it reads. It reads, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Now, at this marvelous point in the story, we've got to pull back. <laughs> Hate to leave you hanging. First, to affirm again, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson is Aramaic common language. So he is not reading the foreign language of the rune as foreign language. He is translating these runes. These Think of them that way. They're magical glowing symbols on a wall put there by God. He's understanding them. And there's, is it three? Is it four? It's three because many, many is a repetition, right? So somehow the, the rune holds that or there's a fourth rune. In either case, he interprets it. Right, and then translates it. And they would have known these words. When it wouldn't have sounded like many, many tickle parsons, like weird to him. He it would have sounded instead like numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. That's that's what he would have heard. And then Daniel will explain that. We're gonna come back to that. But it's at this point I think we gotta pull we gotta pull back here. Because at some point we need to address the challenge of this text. Because it's just it's a phenomenal story, right? But when when Dan Carlin of Hardcore History makes use of it, he just goes in assuming it's all made up because it has nothing to do with or cannot be put into, so far as his understanding would go, the extra-biblical accounts that we have of the time and the events. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to open up the problem, and I'm going to try to show you how the answer is very easy. But it's important that you understand the complications of the problem because it has everything to do with the challenge of critical history. That when you're dealing with extra biblical resources, it's not like they always agree either. And so you're faced with a question in which you must pit one historian who we usually trust against another historian who we usually trust. And you go to ask, well, which one do we trust now? And that is somewhat what goes on here, somewhat. And it starts with the fact that there is no mention of any Chaldean king named Belshazzar. Anywhere. Anywhere even in the Bible. In the Bible, Isaiah talks about this guy and calls him Amal Marduk. So, <laughs> you know, who is this guy? Well, he talks about Amal Marduk, I should say. He doesn't necessarily associate these those two names together, but it, it, it is what it is. I'm going to try to prove that now. But Belshazzar is not mentioned anywhere. And that, of course, presents a challenge. So, we say, who, who is he? It's not a problem for someone to have different names. That's only a problem if you're an ignorant, you know, Wikipedia-level atheist or Christian. Names change all the time in the Bible or in the ancient world. That's fine. But then who is he and how does what we know about him fit with what we know about those who came after Nebuchadnezzar? And like we looked at last time, we have to deal with a number of issues. So there's a guy named Barosus who was a historian of that era, but we don't have his actual work. We only have what Josephus records of Barosus. I believe we talked about that quite a bit in the last episode of, of Daniel. 
But he says this, and remember this, this is going to be the right answer once we go through the big circle, but it, it we're starting with the right answer, then we're going to ask a question about it, and then we're going to move in a big circle and come back to it. He says this, he says, Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded in the kingdom by his son, evil Merodach, who reigned badly and was put to death by Negrelesser, the husband of his sister, after he had reigned two years. This Nereglesser succeeded him and reigned four years. His son, Labaroserodach, don't worry about that one too much, the L guy, uh, being still a child, reigned after him nine months and he was murdered by his friends because he gave many proofs of bad character. So now you got the guy, the son of Nebuchadnezzar is murdered his, by his sister's husband who reigns and then his son is murdered by his friends because both of them were basically completely worthless for ruling. Speaking of this latter guy, it says his murderers by a general resolution transferred the government to Nabonidus. Huh, I said it wrong. Nabonidus, one of the Babylonians who belonged to the conspirators. So, you know, one of the conspirators now takes the throne. So now the throne is being held in Babylon, but for the first time it's outside of the royal line of Nebuchadnezzar. Under him, this new guy, and notice how Barossa speaks pretty highly of this guy. Under him, the walls of Babylon along the riverbanks were better built. But in the 17th year of his reign... Cyrus came from Persia with a great army and took Babylon after he had subjugated all the rest of Asia. Nabonidus went out to encounter him, but was vanquished and fled with his followers and shut himself in Borsippa. But Cyrus, after he had taken Babylon and demolished its walls, marched against Borsippa, besieged Nabonidus, and he could not hold out. Therefore, he surrendered himself, but was treated humanely by Cyrus, who removed him from Babylon and gave him Carmania as a place of residence where he spent the remainder of his days and died. Quite a bit about him, right? Not very much about Abel Merodach. Quite a bit about this other guy, this latter guy. So the challenge becomes uh, twofold. Uh, the text that we have before us says that this is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but it's also going to tell us, and we haven't gotten there in the story, it's going to tell us that the meaning is not only that he's going to die that very night after a party, but also that the kingdom will be taken from him and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that doesn't happen that very night, if it is evil Merodach. The one who has the kingdom taken from him and given to the Medes and the Persians is this latter guy, Nebonidus. So there, there's another historian from the Oriental East named Abidinus, and he's also only preserved in a fragment by Eusebius, but he says effectively the same thing. So we have the same story from two people about the, the history of the family. He says, There arose after Nebuchadnezzar his son Amomaradakus, whom his son-in-law Niglasaris immediately murdered, whose only son Labasarakus remained yet alive, but it happened to him also that he met a violent death. It was commanded that Nabonidokus should be placed on the throne of the kingdom. Now he calls this guy unfit to occupy it, even though Borsus says otherwise. But Cyrus, after he had taken possession of Babylon, appointed him Margrave of the country of Carmania. Darius the king removed him out of the land. Now, who Darius is is a whole other question. We'll have to wait till the next episode for that one. But, so you have these two guys who agree. There's actually a third guy who uh, also fits with the same storyline. His name is Alexander Polyhistor. He also is recorded in Eusebius. But now you have a totally different set of histories recorded by a totally different set of people, the Greeks, Herodotus and Xenophon. These guys are pretty well known because we rely on them for a great deal of our Western civilization history. The challenge is not only with just understanding how the Greeks are different from the Persians, or these aren't Persians yet, I suppose, from the Orientals, but how they're not just different, they were enemies. By the time that Herodotus is writing this, You've already had wars between Persia and Greece that are pretty significant ones. Persia has attempted to invade Greece. So this is like this is like your enemy writing your history. Now, how are they going to do with that? What kind of job are they going to do with your history? Are they going to be unbiased in their giving of it? So that's a little bit of the question here, especially as their accounts don't match. They focus instead on a number of queens who rule well, until the son of what they call Naito Chris, a guy named Labanetos, remember the L guy, the second murdered child, until that guy 
wasn't a child, apparently. In their story, he, he was murdered, though, when Cyrus waged war against Babylon. And they do sell, tell some truth here. So that, that battle that happens, and this is probably when this other guy, the other N guy, Nabonidus, it's probably under him rather than under the L guy. During a event that's taking place, a big party, Cyrus springs a surprise attack on the nation, and he does so by upstream, a long way upstream, diverting the actual course of the Euphrates River uh, so that uh, he's able to cross it down into the city much more easily and invade Babylon while no one's ready for it because it's like at a festival time too. It's not like just the king's having a party. It's like Christmas Eve kind of thing. It's George Washington crossing, not the Tiber. I know I said Tiber. Jeez, Delaware. George Washington crossing the Delaware. Caesar crossed the Tiber. Yes, got it. So Xenophon and Herodotus both talk about this story in this way, but they lay it at the feet of this other guy, the L guy, Labanatus. Both of these guys agree that Babylon was destroyed during a festival, that whoever Belshazzar might have been, the young man was killed immediately after a festival, and that the transfer to the kingdom of the Medes and the Purs all involved the same kind of event, the same singular event. So it almost sounds like you're dealing with what is described in Daniel, but the problem is there's these other kings in the way. And then there's the problem of the tendency to be inaccurate in their telling. The fact that Herodotus and Xenophon line up so well with the biblical story, if not the biblical names, is actually not in their favor. It, it means that maybe that's just where they're getting their information, right? And so that, that causes them to be not really firsthand at all, but secondhand. There's all sorts of like minute problems that arise in the text that I, I don't have them memorized. So all I can do is like read them to you. But for example, you have to have this guy Lebanidas marrying his mother or grandma, that kind of thing. So I'll just let Kyle and Dale kind of say it for themselves. Accordingly, these scanty and indefinite Grecian reports cannot counterbalance the extended and minute statements of Barosus and Abedinus and cannot be taken as regulating the historical interpretation of Daniel 5. Josephus, it is true, understands the narrative in such a way that he identifies Belshazzar with Nabonidus and connects his death with the destruction of the Babylonish kingdom. He states that after Nebuchadnezzar, his son, Evil Merodach, reigned 18 years. But when he died, his son, Neraglisser, succeeded the government and died after he had reigned 40 years. So Josephus really just spreads the thing out and tries to make it possible for that last end guy, the guy who built the walls, to be the one who Daniel's talking about. But that just it just can't be. It doesn't line up at all. They go on, they say, Since then, the extra-biblical authorities contradict one another in this, that the Chaldean historians describe Nebonidus, the last king of the Chaldean kingdom, as a Babylonian not of royal descent, who after putting to death the last descendants of the royal family usurped the throne, which, according to their account, he occupied till Babylon was destroyed, while, on the other hand, Herodotus and Xenophon represent the last Babylonian king, whom Herodotus calls Labanatus, as of royal descent and a successor of his father on the throne. And they connect the taking of Babylon with a riotous festival held in the palace and the city in general, during which Xenophon says the king was put to death. Therefore, the determination regarding the historical context of Daniel 5 hinges on this point, whether Belshazzar is to be identified on the authority of the Greek authors with Nabonidus or in the authority of the Chaldean historians as a very different king from him, and one of those two kings who were dethroned by murder and conspiracy, those who were related to Nebuchadnezzar directly. Now, all of this is a problem in part because of what Daniel says the meaning of the words is. And I want, I want to tell it like story, but just a hat tip, but you should know this already, right? He says the king's going to die tonight, and the kingdom is going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. And because we are such wooden Americans, the Germans did it too, we, were, we are so insistent on reading words the way we would read them in our language that we forget that the ancient languages don't always have the same assumptions in the sentences. So just because he says you're going to die tonight and your kingdom is going to be given to the Medes and the Persians doesn't mean that the second half after the and has to happen tonight. You're going to die tonight, and then later, the kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. 
It is perfectly acceptable for the language to mean that. And kaboom. Now it's all a lot easier. Now we can just say, quite frankly, the first king who gets killed after a party. Oh, wait, that's this guy. Oh, yeah. Evil Merodach. There you go. And then later, the resting of the kingdom out of the line of Nebuchadnezzar and evil Merodach happens first by their own hand as they murder each other. And then by one of the Babylonians who finally cuts them out and then he can't hold on to it anymore. And that's all just the fulfillment of what takes place. I want to clear up something. I, I said Belshazzar does not appear as a name in extra biblical sources. I meant the ones that I was just talking about. The name does appear in that ancient world, whether it's the same guy is, is part of the question. So when you find the name inscribed on a stone in part of the wall that was maybe built by this guy who came later than Ebel Merodach, right? Was that, was that the same guy he's referring to, or is it some other guy? It wasn't himself. That's clear. People think it's his son. Okay, that's fine. So just, just understand that the name is not entirely unique to Daniel in terms of being a name, but it's unique to the accounts, right? So again, we're trying to figure out who he really was, historically speaking. But this is then where we got to land. And I'm in full agreement. I thought it before I went to the text of Kyle and Dalich, but I think it all the more now. I'm in full agreement with them. Quote, There are weighty reasons for regarding Belshazzar as the son and successor of Nebuchadnezzar who was put to death by his brother-in-law, Nereglissar, and therefore identifying him with Amomaradokos. Of this guy... Barosus, probably the most trustworthy historian we have on the matter. He says that he managed the affairs of government poorly. This entirely harmonizes with the description of him that we see in Daniel chapter 5. He was murdered from within his family by a conspiracy that had to involve his counselors. And this also harmonizes with Daniel chapter 5. The only, there's only two arguments against him being the one that we can connect this to actually there's three the the first one is the timing of the the collapse which we already have dealt with it's very easy the word and doesn't always mean the same thing it means and but it's got wider and smaller things right baptize and teach does that mean you have to baptize first and then teach or does it mean that you have to do both of those things at some time do they all have to happen at one time do you have to baptize before you teach right and can be a fluid word it means these things go together but how? Well, that the context has to determine. So th there's two other arguments then against Emil Meridakos being Belshazzar, evil Meridak being Belshazzar. The first one is simply that the names don't line up, that, that Belshazzar and Emil Meridakos are just so different. One mentions the god Bel, one mentions the god Marduk. Well, that can't be the same guy. Well, okay, fine, except for in the ancient world, people had all sorts of names. Kings had very, very long names, multiple titles. So not a big deal there at all. In fact, it's, it's likely, I kind of like this idea, that the name God Save the King, as Daniel uses it here, is somewhat of a snotty remark. Like, it may have been one of his lesser names, but it's also similar to Daniel's name. And Daniel's like saying, hey, look, you're not listening to the God who saved your father. And so he, he refers to him by this name, which was his, but was a minor name, whereas history calls him Man of Marduk, because that's what he wanted to be called. The other argument is that the Bible records that Emil Meridokos was kind to King Jehoiachin, who was in the prison in Babylon. Right? This is one of the, the sons of Judah, the kings of Judah, who was captured and put into prison. The Bible tells us he was kind to him. And so what the argument goes is, well, therefore, evil Meridok could not have been a worthless man. Because obviously, bad people never do good things. Not once. Right? We're not complex at all. You're either black or you're white, period. Right? Well, no, not obviously. That's the way. The, that's why both of these arguments are kind of like they're nonsense arguments. They're they're very weak. The strong argument is the timing. That is the strong argument. These things are just sort of like hoot nanny. Oh, I should have mentioned. And there's one more. This is like a this is like a footnote. This isn't even a real thing. There is a discrepancy between the length of the time that evil Merodach reigned and the length of the time as Daniel describes his reign, two years versus three years. But this is also so easily done when you understand that you're working with different ways of keeping time by different historians. Not all historians had a calendar the way we have a calendar. And so they had to deal with things, well, more randomly. Let's just say they round up and they round down differently at different times depending on who you're talking to. So the difference between a king who reigns two years and a king who reigns uh, three years 
is a, is not a difference because maybe he reigned two years and nine months, right? Nobody like dies on the date that they started to reign. So when he's reigned two years, six months, and three days, which one is it? They don't say two and a half years, right? They got to say three or two. Which one do they pick? And different people, different civilizations have different levels of deciding that. Some just always ran all the way up. If you were more than two years, you're just three years, no matter what, right? Or some go down no matter what. So again, it's not, it's not a problem. It's not a problem in the text. And I hate to even waste your time with this because this is a footnote of a footnote. It's not even an issue worth worrying your minds about anymore, but it was. So the one of the big pushes of liberal scholasticism on rejecting Daniel and other latter Old Testament books as being authentic is the belief that they were all written during the intertestamental times by people who aren't who they say they are and that they're not about what they say they're about. They're actually about the reign of the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes IV over the returned and restored kingdom of Judah. Think Maccabees time, right? So the idea is that all these latter books that have prophecies about things that happen later in history that they couldn't possibly know because miracles aren't possible, well, they must have been written later, and the time when they could be written was the time of the Maccabees, and so all of this is really just uh, analogy, you know, story with a symbol for the Maccabean revolt over and against Antiochus Epiphanes. The thing is, it is such a nonsensical approach. You can't even begin to tie these stories to each other. Daniel is nothing like Judas Maccabeus or any of the other individuals in the stories, and the king is nothing like uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. So you're at the point there where you're just making stuff up. You're farting into the wind and calling it knowledge. And so it's, it's not really worth dealing with. If you want to, Kyle and Deal, it's, they spend like three, four pages, solid pages, tearing this thing apart. How this how this story cannot possibly be overlapped with that. There's too many discrepancies. It makes no sense. They would have, they would have written a different story if they're going to write an analogy. So that's there too. It's an argument. It's not an argument. Farting into the wind is not an argument unless you're four years old. Now, I hope I didn't lose you too much. I mean, it's, it's nitty gritty there, right? But it's got to be dealt with because you got to be able to ask, is this authentic? You have to be able to see that it is. Not because the Bible has to prove itself, but because the Bible is true, it's going to be true. It's going to, it may overturn what we read in various places of history, but not so entirely that you can't find any connection to it at all. And the way this argument was put to me in the past, the way I'd heard it before I studied it, was that there's just no basis in history at all for this argument. Just period. There's nobody who could possibly fit this story. The, the, you have the Babylonian histories, and you got Daniel, and they just don't they don't line up. That that's I don't I don't want to put that in Dan Carlin's mouth, but I'm pretty sure that the guys who he's just assuming are right, that's the argument they make. And I think I think I've shown pretty clearly that the primary source of the history of the lineage of Nebuchadnezzar and the fall of Babylon very much aligns directly with this story if you just give up on your need for and to do more than it does. Again, I hope that that wasn't too narrow or too much in the weeds there because uh, it's just it's diametrically important to see and to be able to say, hey, it's pretty straight up. Belshazzar was Amal Merodachus and everything that's said about Amal Merodachus by the Babylonian historians lines up with what Daniel says. And frankly, everything that Daniel says about the kingdom of Babylon eventually being given to the Medes and the Persians, which that's all he says, that that's going to happen, right? Uh, that, 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 that pretty much happens too. Now, so, well, when does Daniel say this? And he's standing there chiding the king in front of 15,000 drunk people, calling him out for worshiping stone and silver and being nonsensical and not knowing his own dad's words. And then looking at these magical, are they glowing? I like to think of them as glowing. These glowing green ghostly runes sitting there sparkling on the wall with you know circles and corners and spins and who knows what they look like, right? And he says, I can read these words. Are you kidding me? I can read these words. I do have the Holy One God actually giving me this gift. And you should have been using me this whole time, sir. Mene, mene, teko, parson. Numbered, numbered. Weighed, divided. Oh, it just sounds so cool in, well, in the, in the Aramaic. Let's see. Can we do it better in English? Counting, counting, wanting, broken. 
This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, numbered, counted, added up. You've been, Amal Meridukas, you've been calculated. That's the first thing that has happened. God has calculated you, and he has calculated the days of your kingdom and the number that it will last before he brings it to an end. He has counted and calculated tekel, right? Weighed, wanting. There's a balance. They're calculating using a balance, a set of scales. And on one side is good, and the other side is you. And guess what's happening? Good is way heavier than you. You're flying up. You are the same weight as a duck, right? We're not talking odds here. We're talking scales, and they are not in your favor. And then Parson, Ufarson, Perez, they're just different ways of translating the same word. Divided, broken. Your kingdom, not divided in half, half to Medes, half to Persians. Your kingdom is being ripped from you. It's falling apart. And the end of it's falling apart is going to be its collapse beneath the Medes and the Persians. Hey, king, it means you are out of time, you are not worthy, and it's all getting taken away from you. Now, again, imagine being in this room. You're at the way back, right? But you can hear it all, and you're like sipping on your wine. At a certain point, you stop sipping on your wine. <laughs> you're like, whoa, this is a thing. What's going to happen? You don't talk to the king like this. Amazingly, amazingly, Belshazzar makes good on his word. He clothes Daniel in this, it says purple in the English, but purple in the ancient world was a little bit of a different thing. It was, you know, it was the most expensive of the dyes. Everyone kind of learned that in grade school, right? It's the most expensive of the dyes, but it wasn't the purple that we think of now. It had a scarlet edge to it. And so I like to think of it as, as more of a scarlet purple. It's got a red tint within it. A very strong and powerful color, though, definitely associated with royalty. The chain of gold around his neck would have been not merely a pretty thing, but a mark of his power. So both of these things actually historically were marks of office. So when you would wear them, they would have different symbols on them, perhaps, but they would say, this is a noble. You watch out for this guy. He's got power, right? Do what he says. So that's given to him, and he's proclaimed third ruler in the kingdom. Yes, maybe. Who was second in charge? Wasn't he here before? It it seems maybe more likely that the king had three guys who sort of were his inner council, his triumvirate, and they kind of ruled on his behalf while he partied. That kind of thing, maybe. So he gets he gets put into that situation. Now, why is he doing this? Why is he not angry? Right? Why is he not you know like Ahab? I don't believe any of it. And I have you killed? Right? Why do you always prophesy against me? Well. The best thought for that one is he's trying to placate God. So, all right, well, okay, I saw the finger. That finger's scary. And this guy who says he knows this God who did this finger thing, uh, he says that I'm I'm in trouble. So what if I, I'm nice to this guy, right? I'll, I'll, I'll bring him up, and then God will have to, like, let me go a little while, right? He, he didn't realize uh, how immediate and unrevocable this command was that it was it was done and going to happen and so he he elevates daniel and then the text in daniel is very very short here that very night belshazzar the chaldean king was killed and darius the mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old now again don't weigh the and too heavenly it was heavily it wasn't that night the only thing that's that night is belshazzar dying now you can imagine this too imagine that you're you're not really happy with this guy in general. And then in the midst of this crazy feast, you see him suddenly shifting the reins of power, maybe moving you out of the triumvirate and moving Daniel in, who knows, but in the chaos of this happening that very night, you know, the guy's going back drunk now, everyone's moving around because we got new orders. What a time to strike. And that's exactly what happens. Now, the way we are going to say this happened is that it's his brother-in-law, the husband of his sister, Nera Glisser, who actually causes this coup, right? B- brings about an insurrection against the fool. That happens immediately under cover of darkness with ninjas and unicorns all about, right? It's, it's just like, it's cool. It's assassination stuff. Kingdom falls, kingdom rises. Next day, 
I'm in charge now. I'm married into the kingdom. You guys all know you were with me on this, right? Yeah, we know this guy couldn't do it. Here we go. And they get a couple of years of good rule out of him before his son takes over and dies. And then another guy who does a really good job. And then eventually along comes Chirash, Cyrus the Great, with his puppet king, mini king, Darius the Mede. Not a puppet king, but, you know, one of his generals of sort. We'll, we'll get into that. Who comes and actually conquers conquers Babylon. Daniel just fast forwards through that. Just boom, now Darius the Mede, as prophesied, is in charge of the kingdom. And we got another story. But, but for that, we're going to have to wait. For today, what I haven't done at all is tie this to, to Christ. And to do that, we're going to need a little review of the structure of the book. Remember that the book largely falls into two sections, a latter section that is visions and divine revelations regarding the development of the world powers over against the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God's eventual destruction of them. The first half of the book is a combination of stories in which the rulers of the world powers attempt to force the servants of God to submit to their gods. These stories, which take place in chapter 3 and chapter 6, are surrounded by visions that are being given to these world leaders to compel them to see they can't really do this. So think of it this way. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 are like little nuggets in the center. They're kind of the point. Nebuchadnezzar goes mad in order to know that he is mad to not believe in the true God and repent to come believe in the true God. And his son, similarly, in his madness, does not repent and is removed from his throne. He cannot fight against this God. On either side of these two stories are the account of the fiery furnace, right? Where Nebuchadnezzar attempts to compel the friends of Daniel to submit to the authority of his gods. We're going to have next the story of Daniel and the lion's den. So those are these bookends stories about the attempts of the world powers to force the Christians to submit. And in the middle, you have God forcing the world powers to submit. On the outside of this are the bookends of chapter 2 and chapter 7, which are a broader vision given to the world power and to the church. Chapter 2 to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 7 to Daniel, a broader vision of the history of the world in which world powers will fall one after the other, but only the ultimate kingdom of God shall reign. So where does the handwriting on the wall fit into that big picture, and how does it point us to Christ? Firstly, it is the second of two stories about the world power being given a chance to repent. And in the first one, the man who is in charge of the world power becomes a believer, and in this one, he does not. And it is all ripped from him. So it is about law and gospel, repentance and faith, the confrontation of an evil man by a prophet, once to his belief and once to his unbelief. But then you have this other exciting typological reality. Mene, mene, tekel, upharsin, calculated, calculated, insufficient annihilation. If you're going to count the value of the days of a man and then weigh the value of his worth and righteousness, with the result being annihilation of all that are unworthy, well, then Emil Maradakis never had a chance, did he? Not really. And while we don't want to, dis- to dismiss the value of the first article, the value of doing good things, and that we should strive to be good with the good things God has given us, don't miss that at the cross, all of this is still taking place. At the cross, God is calculating, calculating, weighing a sufficient man. And annihilating him, destroying and dividing him in the place of you. Mene, mene, tekel, upharsin is glorious and fantastic gospel when it is spoken of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross in your place. Insufficient as you, but sufficient for you. Taking your insufficiency into himself that it might die, and yet replacing it Not with a divided kingdom, but with a broken grave. Calculated, 
calculated, sufficient resurrection. That is the marvelous good news that Daniel was there to confess, to proclaim, to hold fast in hope toward. And this one little story in the midst of it intended to show us that the world power, those who are unbelievers, pagans, always have God speaking to them, always have a chance to believe if you want to talk in that language, but not everyone wants to believe that this is a nugget. This is kept inside of a greater picture that's going on in which unbelief is always trying to destroy belief, but God will not allow that to happen. Because while kingdom fall after kingdom fall, the kingdom that is ours in the resurrection of Christ remaineth. And that is God's judgment. That is God judging us. First, lacking, wanting, insufficient. Second, in Jesus, righteous, complete, sanctified, holy. A foolhardy king deserves to be overthrown by his brother-in-law. But you, Christian are no servant of a foolhardy king. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? If so, Rev Fisk and his family would love to have it. Head over to projectresurrection.blog or click the Patreon link in the show notes below if you think the laborer is worth his wages. (laughs) 